Hello and welcome to the next installment of our Saratech Enablement Series. My name is Monique Anderson. I am the Marketing Coordinator at Saratech and I will be your host today. Presenting today we have Dan Nadeau who is an Applications Engineer here at Saratech and he'll be teaching some tips and tricks about the FEMAP Post Processing Toolbox. First I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Saratech Enablement Series that we've had great success with. We usually run about 30 to 45 minutes and our training is always led by subject matter experts. We cover topics including FEMAP, NX, Solid Edge, Team Center, and much more. Be sure to check out our website for dates and times which may vary in the coming months due to customer feedback. Our goal for the Saratech Enablement Series is to help you get the most out of your software, to share knowledge amongst each other, and to build a community of users that will help empower each other. As always, this is an open forum and we look forward to participating in the training. If you have questions or comments during the presentation, Please type them in the chat box to the right of your screen and I'll kindly interrupt Dan and let him know your comments and questions. And with that, I will pass the baton to Dan. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Nato. I'm an application engineer for Saratech. So my primary focus is FEMAP, NX NASTRAN, NX CAE and CAN. So today we're going to spend uh, our time going through uh, FEMAP. So what we're going to be discussing today is using the post-processing toolbox. So I broke this down into two little sections. So the first section is just a brief overview of what we're going to be covering. Um, so what we can do, and then I'm going to physically go in and show you how to, how to do it and what it can do. So first one is just a little bit of talking. The second section is more of doing it and demoing it inside a few maps. So as always, when I do these presentations, I like to bring up the FEMAP users community. So this is a location where you can get good quality information uh, about FEMAP. So this is a lot of users and a lot of the developers go here to answer questions, write questions, uh, a lot of great information of up and coming FEMAP things come here as well. So if you visit the site, you'll notice that FEMAP version 11.4 has been released. It actually has been released uh, for I think two days now, so if you guys need updated licenses and software, please feel free to reach out to us and we can, uh, we can set you up with that. So the post-processing toolbox, what is it? So it's just a collection of post-processing tools that's easy to use and easy to navigate. So there are other ways to post-process. I call it the F5 method, so you can press the F5 and then you can define what you want to deform and contour and you have many options from there. Now the reason why I recommend using this post-processing toolbox is it's all located in one location. So inside this toolbox we can change colors, fringe plots, deform plots, change the scales, and all sorts of changes all in one easy interactive location. So inside the post-processing toolbox you have these options. So we can do deform plots, contour plots, and free body plots. So under deform plots, we can do deformed, animate, we can animate multi-set, we can do arrow plots, trace plots, and streamline plots. Under contour, we have contour plots, criteria plots, beam diagrams, ISO surface, section cuts, and contour arrows. And under our free body, we can create individual free bodies, we can find interface loads, and now we can do section cuts. So the first one is deform. So here are those uh, styles. So we have our normal deform. So this is a, a normal deform plot that you'll see uh, when you think about FEA analysis. So you'll notice that it is all, all these outputs are using nodal data. So be careful when you do that. Uh, FEMAP will let you select elemental data, but just be careful that you, you want to actually be contouring nodal data. And then the next one is an animate. So it's, a, it's the same as a deformation plot, except it's in motion, so animation. Animate multi-set, it's the same as animate, except we have multiple sets, so a lot of times this is maybe a transient analysis, so you want to animate from time zero to time, I don't know, one second, so you can view each uh, iteration. Vector plot, it's, just, it's very similar to a deform plot, but it gives you a visualization of a vector which has the, the magnitude and, the, and, and a direction of displacement. So a trace plot is basically the same as a multi-set, except it is also showing you a vector plot. So it's giving you a visualization of the history. So you'll be able to see uh, vectors pointing where the, I'll just say the structure was moving. 
And then we also have streamline plots, so you can see uh, streamlines. A lot of times this is what I think about flow. You'd have a streamline, or maybe you want to see how something is moving through the model. Our next option is contour plots. So contour plot is the normal fringe plot that you think of when you think about FEA. So this is our, our normal plot, so you're getting nodal output. The next one is a criteria plot. plot. It's uh, very similar to a contour plot, except this time it's only giving you elemental output, so your element is going to have one value. But this time you specify some sort of criteria. So I want to see something that is above, below, or between. So maybe you have some sort of uh, safety factor and you want to make sure that all your elements are below that. It's very easy to check this with the criteria plot. Uh, beam diagram, I just think of shear and moment diagrams. Uh, isosurface plots, so this is uh, useful for solid elements. So you want to see uh, how the stress is going through the structure. You might want to uh, throw an isosurface plot. Uh, section cut plot is where we're going to go ahead and cut into the structure. And then the last one is a vector plot. So uh, a lot of times you want to view a, an arrow of the direction. So a lot of times maybe you want to plot major and minor principles and you want to make sure that the, how they're flowing through the structure is how you want. And I'll, I'll show you uh, all these types of plots as we go. Now this is uh, one location where I get a decent amount of questions is this data conversion. So it controls how centroid, corner, and nodal data are converted for nodal contours. So you have your options here. So we either have corner data or without corner data. And this is how it is being calculated. So you'll see that we can, with using corner data or without, we can grab average, average values, max values, and minimum values. And this is how it's being calculated. This little uh, graph over here to the left is, is a great visualization of what's going on. So. This is just a question that gets asked a decent amount, so I figured I'd add it to the slides. So free body plots is the last option in the post-processing toolbox. So this is useful for showing free bodies, interface, and then those section cut plots like I mentioned earlier. So this information is based on grid point force balance data. Now this isn't a direct output from, from Nastran, so you need to request it. So, uh, on the on the right, I, I'm showing here my output requests. So uh, constraint force is, I believe, on by default. But if you have MPCs, make sure you uh, check equation force. And then if you want to get uh, for your elements, you want to make sure that you check force balance. Now, this is a little bit more computation to get this output, but you, you're going to need this if you want to do the free body plots. So when you're setting up a, a free body, Here's the, the free body tool. So it's broken down into, I'll say, three sections. So we have our top section. It's where we define uh, what output set we want our information from. Our center section is our free body properties. You know, what elements do we want to, to use? What nodes do we want to use? What contributions? Things like that. And then the bottom is controls our visibility. So do we want bigger arrows, smaller arrows, uh, larger markers? So it's broken into those three sections. And we'll go through a model of this in a little bit here. So to create a free body, this, this comes up a decent amount, so I wanted to make sure I, I displayed this. So there is this button right here, which to me looks like a, a shear box. This is the place where you create a free body. So you're going to have to enter in this post-processing toolbox to go ahead and create this shear box. So once you click on this shear box, you can create your free body. It's going to bring you to free body manager. So inside your free body manager, you can uh, create your new free body. And then you're going to hop over to this other window where you specify if you want to create a free body interface or section cut. Now you can change this option later in the po in the post processing toolbox, so you don't need to make sure that you have the I'll just say the correct one up front. But you can change it later. Um, normally, I'll start with a free body and then I'll change it in the post processing toolbox. But maybe if you know you're going to use an interface load, you might want to check it ahead of time. And inside here, you can go ahead and specify your contributions and how you want it to be displayed before you get into the post-processing toolbox. It, it might be a way to, to save yourself some time if you know that you're going to be doing an interface or section cut later down the line. So I know this slide might be a little harder to see. I just want to make sure I had this in the notes. This is directly out of the help documents. Um, so sometimes I have some questions and I need to look up some of these values. So 
the contribution. So what is the applied, the reaction, the multi-point reaction, the peripheral elements, free body, contact elements, glue elements, and the nodal summation? So I just have this uh, here in case anybody has any questions. Uh, we can share this PowerPoint and you can uh, review this and then you can uh, find the actual value. So the one that people ask me questions is, is peripheral elements. So peripheral elements include grid point force and moment contributions from the elements surrounding the free body elements. So it's grabbing the ones that are around the free body elements that you select. All right, so let's go ahead and hop over into FEMAP and let's go through some of these plots. All right. So I have a, a couple different models. I was going to show uh, a couple different outputs. So the first one is a, a simple solid model, and let's just run through uh, the post-processing toolbox as it goes. So post-processing toolbox is tabbed with the model info. Uh, it's right here. So you can move it around. You can dock it, uh, whatever you prefer, just like any other toolbar inside FEMAP. So I'm just going to go ahead and throw that back inside here. If, say, it is missing or you don't know where it's at, it's under Tools, Post-Processing Toolbox. And if you have the default layout, it is right here in the toolbar. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's put these back. All right, let's make it large so everybody can see. So up at the top, we have a, a couple of different uh, buttons. So the first one is toggle all tools. So if you accidentally uh, click on one of these check boxes and it goes away, this is where you can go ahead and get those back. The next one is reload for model. So if you know your results aren't loading and you need to load them, you can go ahead and click on that. The next one over is select output data. So if you select that icon, it's going to bring you up the F5, I'll just say the F5 method. So it's going to bring you this. Uh, so we're not going to be using this for our demonstration, so I'll just remove that. The next button over is set to underform node contour node. So this is the reset button. So let's let's set our model back to scratch. I like to press this button. It gets me to uh, no contour, no deform, no free body. And then the next one is to select a deform and then a contour plot. I'm going to show you how to do that manually. And then the next one over is to go ahead and turn on and off free bodies. And then the next one is to auto redraw. So as I make changes, it's automatically going to update. Maybe your model is very large, and this is, I'll just say, computational, computationally too big. You might want to turn that off and then click on this manual redraw so it draws it whenever you're ready. Maybe you're making some, some changes that are really affecting the model. So let's start with our deform. So under deform, here are the styles that we can choose. So like I said before, deform, animate, animate, multi-set, arrow, trace, and streamline. So I'm just going to go ahead and select deform, and you'll notice that my model has became deform. So one important thing to see here is our output set, NAS train, for my case, this is case one. But if you have multiple cases, you need to make sure that you're grabbing the correct case. So there is a left and right arrow, so that is a way that you can move between different cases. And then there is a, I'll just say bracket, where you can select the middle and you can specify uh, via a list which output set. In mine, I only have one case. So I'll go ahead and grab that one case. And the same with the output vector. Most of the time you're going to be plotting some sort of translation, but maybe you want to go ahead and change this to uh, some other uh, output vector in this case. Now, one thing to be careful, I've seen this done, is it will let you deform uh, von Mies stress. It doesn't make any sense, but, it, but it'll let you do it. So just be careful uh, that you make sure that when you're under deform, you're not you're not selecting the stress value. So most of the time, it's always going to be some sort of translation value. So below that, there are options to transform it. If you need to transform your output into a different coordinate system, we can specify that here. Uh, we can also scale models. So right now, it's showing me 10% of the model. I can always change this to actual deformations. And I can also scale my actual deformations so I can see what's going on. Now, one nice thing in this bottom left corner, it is telling me how much it's deformed. As you can see, it's barely deforming at all. So scaling by 100% of actual deformations is still nothing. So in this case, it would make sense to go ahead and give me a percentage of the model. And we can always increase this value to drastically view what's going on, if it's hard to see. So just be aware that this is actually a, a scaler. All right. So you can deform relative to a location. So if you want to go ahead and deform it to based on some sort of 
node, you can go ahead and select that and it'll change based on this as the original location. Don't see this done very often, but we have the capabilities. Then we have options for our under four model. So we can show our under four model. Now this is useful if you don't have geometry and you maybe you want to see how much it moved. And under there, you do have some options. So if you want to, maybe you don't like blue or something, maybe you're more into orange, we can go ahead and change those uh, to a separate color so it makes it easier to visualize. Now the same thing can be said for the D4 model. Uh, right now it's, it's using the entity colors, but maybe for some reason you want it to be a different color. You can go ahead and change that. So that is our deform style. Our next style is animate. So now we have our, our structure and animation. I'm not too sure how this is going over the internet, um, but as long as the part looks like it's moving, uh, it's being animated. So just like before, we have our same options below. I'm going to cut down this animation for a second. And just like before, we have the same options, except now we add another button at the bottom that says animate. So now if you expand animate, you have some options as well. So inside animate, you can go ahead and change it to a half absolute, sign half absolute. So you can do half, half and full. So it's up to you what you want to do here. So in my case, I'll just do a half absolute. So it's only going in the direction as the, the load is going. And then I have control of how many frames. So in this case, it looks like I need some more frames. Maybe it's a little blotchy trying to go uh, throughout the internet. And then I have some delay control. So I, do I want it to go faster or slower? And then I also have animation control, which is these three arrows, which gives me dynamic, well, I'll just say dynamic moving. So I can speed it up, go faster, and I have control of those delays. So it just gives me the same settings I have, except now it's in one interactive box. All right. The next one is animate multi-set. Let me hop over to another model, and we'll do that. So here is my, my next model. I ran... Uh, some sort of transient analysis of this. So let's go ahead and hop over here. And this time I'll say animate multi-set. And now you see I have output set and final output set. So I want to start at time zero and I'll go to time, I don't know, I'll go to 0.12. So basically this thing is, is, is uh, being shocked and then it's uh, damping uh, down to its uh, original shape. So hiding the original geometry, we can see you know what's going on. It might not be translating uh, the best over the internet. But basically what I'm doing is I'm animating over this entire set. So it it's going through all these iterations and it's plotting each one of these cases. So the next one is an arrow plot. Let's hop back to our other plot to make it easy to see our arrow plot. So an arrow plot is just like a deform plot, except it's showing you arrows with this magnitude and direction. So we have the same options as before, except now we have a thing called arrows, and you can, can, can change the arrows. So maybe you want arrowheads, not uh, components, uh, show as solids. So you want to make solid arrows. So you have control over the visibility of what's going on. You can change the color. Maybe you don't like yellow in this case. You can go ahead and change those as well. So as you can see so far, we have all these changes that we're able to do interactively within you know, one toolbox. So the next plot is a trace plot. So I guess I'll, I'll skip that for one second. I'll show a quick streamline plot in this solid. Most of the time this is used for fluid flow, but I'll show it in this uh, solid model. So I'm just gonna make sure I'm snapping to a node snap to this node here and you can visually I don't know how well that's showing up you can see the the flow uh, throughout the structure all right so let's go ahead and turn this off and let me hop back to the other plot of my transit and I'll go ahead and this time I'll specify I want a trace plot so this is doing the same thing as it did before, except now it's giving me arrows of where it's tracing its, its I'll just say its pattern. So if maybe there was some sort of clearance that it needed to avoid up here, maybe you can visualize and see if it's actually hitting these regions. So it's the same as an animate multi-set, 
except now we can visualize the path. So imagine if this was swinging in different directions, we can visually see uh, what's actually going on. So just like before, same options, except now we have something for trace, where you can put some labels and you can change colors and um, change. Uh, maybe you don't want to trace the whole model. Maybe you're only interested in one node. Maybe you think that node's going to hit something. Uh, or you visually want to see where that node is going, we can tr we can view that with the trace plot. All right, so let's go ahead and turn off our trace. So that is our, our deform plot. Um, so there's lots of options, they're all there. And now let's hop over to our contour plot. I'm just going to switch to a different model here again. Uh, just makes it easier to see what's going on. So now our contour, we go ahead and and we specify our contour. So in this case, we're going to do the first one. So we just want to do a normal contour plot. So this is a normal fringe plot that you would see and whenever you think about FEA. All right. So this time we want to check our output set. So in this case, I did seven output sets so that we can visualize and go what's going. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab, I'll say, this case, which has a load in the X and a load in the Y. And right now, I'm looking at total translation. Maybe in this case, I want to look at plate top VAMI stress. So that is output set number 7033. Now, there's this huge list. There is filters up here. So if you need to filter it, you can go ahead and filter it. So maybe you have complex output. Maybe you want to only find stresses, strains. So in my case, I'll just go to stress. And now it's just showing me stress. So it just helps me uh, filter and find certain entities. So I'll say plate top VAMI stress. And now I can view the, the plate top uh, stress. Now, I do have this additional vectors. So if I want to plot other output vectors, maybe I want to plot plate bottom, and maybe I want to plate the, the beam stresses, I can plot those. Now, I believe this came out in FEMAP 11.3 that you can plot solid plates and uh, 2D elements all in one. I'm, I'm sorry, 1D. So you can do 1D, 2D, and 3D all in one plot. So you have these three vac vectors. Now, if you are doing something like a plate top, there is a option down here for type for double-sided planar, and it'll go ahead and do plate top and plate bottom for you. And you'll be able to visually see that down here at the bottom of the uh, graphic window. So now I'm plotting plate top and plate bottom VAMI stress in one plot. But in my case, I'm going to add an additional vector, and I'm just going to go ahead and show some uh, stress for these uh, 1D elements. Uh, so I'll just say, uh, I'll just do a combustion comp stress. So, there we go. so now I have uh, values for these as well in my, my French plot. As you can see, those are taking over those values. So that is a way to go ahead and grab those informations. So let me just organize this so we can see what's going on. So now we have some options for transform. Uh, so you really aren't transforming uh, plate top VAMI stress. So I'll find a, a case where we'll say where this would make sense. So let's just go ahead and grab some sort of normal stress. And you'll see there's this region right here and here, which, which don't look correct compared to the rest. You would think that it would be uniform. So the reason is, if I look at my orientation, and I zoom in, this region, they're, they're going in the wrong, I'll just say in the wrong direction. I don't know how well you guys can see that. But the arrows are going um, in my global minus Z direction, where the rest of the arrows are going in my global uh, X direction. So that's why I'm getting these weird uh, plate top X normal stress values. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn off this orientation and let's just go ahead and transform it right here into a basic rectangular and in my case I want to go in the Z direction. So to go ahead and make that look correct. So this is an important thing sometimes when you're using composites this is where you're going to see it. Now in my case so I'll go back to none, and you'll go back and you'll see that issue. So those should be very similar to uh, the rest of the structure. In my case, I also made the material direction all in this uh, global Z direction. So if I change my 
transform into the material direction, you'll see that that eliminates that error. So basically, I'm transforming it into that same z direction as I did global. But um, you'll you'll notice that when you are doing some sort of composite analysis. So let me hop back over here, and I'll just view this plate top Vami stress again. Seven zero three three. So that's our transform. And then here is our data conversion, which I spoke about. So right now it's averaging. So this is, you know, like I said before, corner with or without corner data. So you can go max value with max without. And there's even things, so no elemental averaging. And you'll be able to see that it is just showing element values. And you can also do the same thing for no average with the centroid centroid data. So it's up to you how you want to do this data conversion, um, if you want to be conservative or not, or how you want you know, these to be calculated. So in this case, I'll just go ahead and specify average. Now there is this data selection. It says contour group. So just one thing real quick is I have this uh, simplified as a group over here, this little entity. So I'm just going to go ahead and show the active group. And you'll see right now the fringe plot changes based on what group I'm looking at. But this option data selection says contour group. But if I change it to visual groups or I change it to all data full model, if I change it to all data full model, my fringe plot doesn't match anymore because there's other data which has different values. So this controls if you want it to look like whatever is in the visual group. So a lot of times you just want to change the scale based on what you're viewing. This is how you can change it to what you're viewing and how you can change it back to the full model. So I'm just going to go ahead and show the full model again. Uh, now we have our type match output. I don't like to change uh, to a different output unless there is a reason. Uh, in our case, we're doing the double-sided planar. So we have plate top and plate bottom uh, stresses. The next one is show on groups. So now we can go ahead and grab that group, but now we're viewing the entire model with it. Um, so now you can visualize the whole group, but only the group that we say is show on groups is the visible one with post-processing information. Now remember, if we change our, our data selection, we can go ahead and change it to the full model as well. So let's just go ahead and say full model. And then there is a show as filled and line. I don't see many line plots, but I assume uh, these might be for printing. Uh, to try to keep it uh, simple, but most of the time you're going to be doing these fill plots. And then we have levels and legends. So under levels, this is where you control the number of levels. So level mode is automatic, but maybe you want to define your own max and min. You can find your own max and min max threshold. So maybe you want to define your own max. You can go ahead and define your own max. Maybe you want to define your own minimum. Maybe you want to set up your own plot. I should have looked at the values before I started typing. So maybe you have some sort of criteria that you're looking for and you want to plot it. You can change the max and min or you can do automatic. Now one thing, you have this colored palette. So you can go ahead and make your own number of levels and the value. And you can change the color to whatever you want. So there is an option for temperature plots, red, yellow, green plots, no magenta plots, you know, things like that. So we can easily uh, change the color palette. We have control over the number of levels. So how many, that's too big. So how many levels do we want over here? So I can upgrade that value and now I have more of these options. There's continuous colors, which just gives you this uh, plot that shows the difference between the colors continuously. Uh, there's an option to have it show this uh, fringe plot while it's animating or not. You can label max and min. Now, if you put on these labels, it might be hard to see the max and min, uh, but it does label them. So I can see uh, max here and min somewhere else. And you can define you know, how many significant digits you want for that label as well. And then you have options for the legend. Uh, so do I want the legend or not? Turn it back on. And then you have options to where, where do you want it? Do you want it top, left, things like that? So you can change that. 
and then you can change the, the colors as well. So maybe you want white or you want it the, the color of the print itself. You can change that. You have control. Label uh, the background. So that just changes this to the same color of the background. This definitely helps if you are doing colors and you are on a white background. And then you can change the, uh, the number of digits and if you need to change these sizes. So you can change how this is looking uh, very easily. Now, since we are talking about post-processing, I'll bring this up real quick. So there is this custom tools, views, switch background for printing. It's just an easy way. It changes a couple of these uh, parameters, so that makes it easy to print. So this might be a nice way to, to start if you are doing some post-processing. All right. So that is a contour plot. The next one is a criteria plot. So when you open up a criteria plot, it's going to put labels on everything. The reason why it puts labels is because it meets some sort of criteria that you have. So right here, I have elements that pass. And if I expand that, I don't, I, I'm going to unlabel all the ones that pass the criteria. So let me try to get this in view real quick so it's easy to see. So right now, I'm trying to find some sort of criteria. So I'm going to do the same load set that I've been doing. I'll look at plate top vomit stress. So my criteria is I want to see things that are above, and I'll just pick a value of 10,000. So now I'm only looking at elements that pass this criteria. So it might be easier if I hide my nodes and we look at it. So these elements are above a maximum value of 10,000, but maybe I want to switch it. Maybe I want to see things that are below a minimum of, I don't know, 10,000 again. So these are the opposite of that. So these are the elements that fit uh, that criteria. So basically, you specify if you want to find things above a value, below a value, between a value, or outside a value. So you're specifying some sort of criteria. So in my case, maybe I want to grab everything above 15,000. You know, maybe that's an area of concern. So these are the elements that breach that region, so maybe I need to support it or, or make some sort of change to get there. So the criteria is some sort of criteria based on that you're looking on. So those criteria are below, below, above, between, or outside. And then you have options to go ahead and label them, and you can change the color of these as well. So just like before, we have levels and legends. Next plot down is a beam diagram. So this would be showing uh, these 1D sections. So I'm just going to go ahead and switch to a group, which I have these bolts. Show our group. Just make it easier to, to visualize. So now let's just go ahead and change it, make sure that we're grabbing some sort of uh, beam diagram to make it easier to view what we're doing. So maybe we want to look at, uh, let's go to moments, I guess. Uh, so I'm just going to remove my filter, so I'm not looking at stress anymore. So let's go down here to our moment, which I think is 3,000 right here, this moment. So now I'm viewing a moment diagram of these beams. And when we switch to the beam diagram, you'll see that we have a little less options. We still have labels and wedges, but now we have show as. You can show as a beam diagram or beam contour. You can put labels on it. So labels at nodes or labels at the peaks. So maybe we want to see what these values are. And then you can change it to the direction that you want. So these are just in a direction, but maybe you need to change it in another direction that makes it easier to visualize, or maybe that's how it's actually acting. All right. So we can you know, show shear shared diagrams as well if we wanted to. Um, just show one real quick. So maybe you want to view, you know, a shear diagram, and you can see which bolt's taking a lot more shear than the other. The next option is isosurface. I'm going to go ahead and switch to another model to show this isosurface and section cut. But let me, while I'm still working with this model, let's go to our contour arrow. And you'll see right away, which is which is nice, this is one of the new features. If I select one of these output vectors, see it grabbed the axial, the shear, in the two directions. 
So it automatically grabbed me the three stresses for this uh, entity for me. So it made it easier to select them, and it's showing me as an arrow plot. So I guess I'll continue to talk about these contour arrows. So inside here, now we have information about the arrows. So if you need to change this 3D components, maybe you don't want to view all the components. You can hide them if you wanted to, or you can show them. But now we can show solid arrows. You have control over the arrows. You can control the length of the arrows, and you can control the labels as well. So maybe you want some more digits and things like that. You can control that. So contour arrow plots are, are very convenient. So in this case, you know, looking at something like uh, the the axial force and the shear force, it, it plots them as, as one location, as, as one uh, single entity. So let me hop over here to uh, this solid plot again. And this one shows a, a good case of showing our contour of showing a section cut. So we can cut into the model. As you can see, we can drag it left and right. We can change the plane. Uh, maybe we want to go in a, a different direction. We can go in a different direction and cut into the structure. So it's real easy to do uh, section cuts. So when you go to section cut, you still have the same options as above, except now you have a cutting plane. And you can vary that cutting plane as you go. And you have an option for dynamic control, which is what I was in, to drag it left and right, up and down. Uh, very easy to do this. Uh, you have some options. You can cut model, and you can do parallel sections. So you can cut into it. You can do multiple sections as well. So maybe you want you know, a couple sections as you go through. You can specify that. And then you can do uh, multiple sections, which is sections in different planes. So if you needed to cut in some other uh, plane as well, you could specify that as well. So if you needed to go across, you could do that. So section cut uh, plots are very straightforward, easy to use, and, and great. So, all right. Uh, I didn't show isosurface plots. So these are uh, usually inside uh, solids. So we have our uh, way we can visualize how the stress is moving through the structure. And when you have isosurface, you just have, same as before, you have dynamic control, so you can view it as it moves in and out of the structure. So you can visualize the, the flow and the stress here. And we have levels and ledges before. Now it looks like I'm running a little late on time, so let me make sure I get in some free body plots. So let me go back to my uh, bolted connection model. And let's just go ahead and we're looking at uh, this plot right here, contour arrow. So let's just go ahead and throw a free body of this, these elements as well, and let's see what, what happens. So let's hit this shear box to create a free body. Create a new free body, and I'll just call it bolts. And now inside here, we specify what we want. We want a free body interface section cut, which we could have specified before. And now we specify what elements we want to free body. So we will select them. And now you should be able to see uh, the free body plots. I don't know how well, so I'll zoom in real good on one of these. These, And the green arrows are from my free body. And you'll notice that they were equal and opposite of the stress value. So as you can see, we are getting uh, the correct values in this region. So these. Uh, Directions are matching this and this. So we are uh, visually looking at the, the same, the same uh, results, if you will. So you have a couple different ways in this case to pull out these bolt forces. So using this visualization, we can see these values. Uh, you can always use a data table and grab uh, physical information. But using the free body is a good way to go ahead and, and grab these uh, outputs. So let's just go ahead and. I'm going to turn off all free bodies, all everything. Let's just go ahead and show the full model. And let's go to another model. So this is the, the airplane uh, wing. So this is a, the normal FEMAP model if you've seen. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw in a quick free body of this wing. And I'm going to show an interface load this time. So I'm going to go ahead and go to free body, and I'm going to select the free body elements. 
So you can select the entities that you're interested in. I'm trying to select, there's a, a rib that goes through here. So I'm going to go ahead and use this group that I have. I'm going to show the highlighter and we can visualize what I'm selecting. So I want to see what is, what is actually going on at this location. So make sure that our free bodies are visible. So now we can see our free body. It might be difficult to see, so sometimes it's easy to hide nodes and elements. Maybe you want to see what's going on. And you can see it's summing up at each one of those nodes that I specified. Now you do have some options in the free body. You have your nodal vectors and your free body contributions. So we specified our entities, which was our elements, and then you can specify your components. Maybe you're not interested in some of these uh, directions, maybe not in Z, or, or X, and you're only interested in the, the component in Y to see if, you know, are we uh, summing to what we think we are, we can go ahead and show and hide these things. So that's a way to go ahead and do it. If you want to show the moment, you can display components for your moments as well, and you can turn them on or off. Now there are our contributions, so from applied, you can show her from the applied, our reaction forces, Multi-point reactions, this, this model doesn't have any, so it doesn't make, and then peripheral elements. So you notice if I turn off peripheral elements, peripheral elements, as I mentioned at the beginning, are all the elements that are connected. Uh, free body elements, so we want to see the ones that we selected. We can go ahead and turn those on or off. So we have control over what these contributions are from. And then we have entity colors as well. So maybe we want to change the colors of these node markers and the force and moment vectors. Right now, mine are all green. Might not be the best for visualization, but you could go ahead and change them. Now, under view properties, you have a lot more options. So do we want to view all these node markers? If you turn them off, it might be visually easier. What do we want as the label? Do we, do we not want labels? We just want the arrows, or how do we want those to be displayed? We can change that. Change the digits, change the length, and then you have individual options for the Force the moment vectors for, for total and your nodal values. So if you want, for some reason, the arrow to be a solid arrow, you can go ahead and change that. So if we have our total force, which we'll get to, um, we can change that. Now, for some reason, maybe you want to change and you want to figure out the interface load. So this is why I create the free body and I manually hit the interface load because it automatically grabs all the nodes for me so I don't have to select them. So it's going to grab them for me and I'm going to create a total summation vector at the center of all these and then yes so now you can see the new uh, summation of all these vectors at the look at the center so it, it just gives me a visualization of all those sum and this is the one that I changed uh, to be a different type of arrow so the trick to free bodies is go ahead and make a simple model and go ahead and play with it so I know I went through a, a lot of different options in the post-processing toolbox, but the trick to this is just getting in there, create a simple model, and go ahead and, you know, play around, press all the buttons, and go from there. So let me go ahead and go back to my slide. It looks like I'm running a little late. So, so basically, I gave you an overview of the post-processing toolbox. I showed you how to use it. Um, I, I tried to click on every button in there. Now, what I recommend doing, like I said, is, is get in there and try it. Um, if you do have any questions, you know, reach out to, you can reach out to me directly or to support at saratechinc.com, uh, whatever is convenient. Um, so a couple reasons why to use it. So it's, it's very easy to use. I hope I showed that. It's fast and interactive. And there's many applications and many buttons all in one location. So if you were using the F5 button, F5 key, I'll say. Now, if you need to change those colors, maybe you need to change those arrows, they're all in one interactive location. So our next session is June 22nd, um, the same time as we did today, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the topic is going to be on Solid Edge ST10, and the presenter for this will be uh, Mr. Rubio. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan, for a great presentation today. Very informative. And to everybody, we will be posting this video to YouTube later today. Feel free to pass along to your friends and colleagues, and please be sure to subscribe to our channel. Follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for upcoming webinar dates and topics. And please don't forget to stick around for just 10 to 15 seconds to fill out the survey. Let us know how we did and what you like. We really greatly appreciate your feedback. 
And thank you everybody so much for attending. Please have a great rest of your day.